Hi, I'm Robin Denning. I'm here with Kara Davis, uh, who is the Gillam County DA and the Special Deputy District Attorney to Wasco County. And she's joining us here today to talk about her position running for Wasco County DA. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Great. So um, tell me about your background, Kara. Tell me about where you went to school and all those kinds of things. I grew up here in the Dalles, Oregon. I went to the Dalles High School. My picture is still up at the Dalles High School if anyone wants to see an embarrassing 90s rendition of Kara. Um, after I graduated from high school, I went to school briefly in London. Oh, cool. And then I transferred to University of Massachusetts in Amherst, Massachusetts. I graduated with honors from there. Um, I spent my last semester of college in Bulgaria studying emerging democracies in a post-communist era. Wow. Yeah. Oh, it was fun. I loved Bulgaria. It was great. Um, After that, I worked in Ireland and New Zealand for a while. And then I went to University of Miami on an academic scholarship. I graduated magna cum laude, Order of the Cloth. Um, I was on the Psychology and Law Review and published in the International Law Journal before going to work in Washington, D.C. as a legislative attorney. And then I came back home to Oregon. Wow, that's top of your class. Oh, yeah. In Latin, for everyone that didn't know. (laughs) Yeah, that's a legal term for top of your class and uh, getting a, um, a position in D.C. straight out of that certainly doubles, you know, doubles that experience for sure. That's- oh, yeah. I wanted to um, go into criminal law straight out of law school. But at, when you were accepting your your jobs in your third year of law school, my best friend from the Dallas was actually murdered. Oh, no. Yeah. That's so horrible. I went into legislative work instead. Um, but I, I really learned a lot watching the process of his case just definitely hit home. That when I came back to Oregon and got involved in criminal law, like what kind of prosecutor or defense attorney I would like to be, that that experience taught me a lot. Wow, that must have been really, um, yeah, an eye-opening experience that was really changed your trajectory. Oh, it it definitely did. And sorry to just jump in there with a bomb right at the beginning. Yeah, Yeah, but that was uh, definitely kind of altered my course for a little bit. What did you do after that? Well, I, my first job in criminal law was actually when I was in high school working for a local firm here in the Dallas called Pitcher and Wright. Mm-hmm. I did a, a mentorship at the local public defender's office all through the last half of my senior year. And then I worked for a while when I was in London as a court clerk. Okay. And then... I came back here to the Dalles and I worked at the Wasco County District Attorney's Office as a deputy DA for Eric Nisley. Okay. I was here for a little under a year before going to Pendleton and I spent 17 years in Pendleton doing defense work, mostly as a public defender, but also with my own firm. And I did everything from traffic tickets all the way up to death penalty. I've handled probably 30 murder cases. Wow. About half of those, I was either the only attorney, only attorney on the case, or I was um, lead counsel. Oh, wow. Yeah. So a lot of murder work, which can be tough. It can be a little soul deadening. For sure. Uh, I did all of the drug court defense work. I did mental commitments, appellate work, post-conviction relief, juvenile work dependency and um, some family law work as well. So it must have been fascinating to see kind of all these different um, tendrils of how the law is intersecting with families. The thing that really struck me was how much mental health intersects in all of these different areas of law, whether you're talking about a custody battle or you're fighting with DHS over your children or you're talking about elder abuse or Or does the elder in your family need to be subject to a conservatorship or guardianship? There's so many different ways, not just in the criminal law, that the mental health really intersects. I I spent some time while I was working in Pendleton getting my master's in forensic psychology because I felt it was really important to be able to understand this from a, a holistic level. Because in order to be able to address these issues, you've got 
very much family-wide, community-wide issues that need to be addressed. And, and so much of it stems from the mental health. And they do all end up intersecting. You see a kid that started in the DHS system as a foster kid, and then 15 years later, they would be on my role as, as a defendant, right? I mean, a kid who's one day a foster kid, and then maybe the next day a victim, and then the next day a defendant, it, it, there's really a lot of causality that you can just kind of see if you're a member of this system and you're looking at it from the outside in. And so it definitely hits every single aspect of our community for sure. It must have been really impactful for sure. Yeah, yes, it was. I I think before I left Pendleton, I had one family. I had represented five generations of that family. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So it could be a little heartbreaking, too. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Wow. That's um, yeah, fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, so um, you're currently the Gillam County DA, if I'm right. And, um, and I wanted to know that if, if you're elected here in Wasco County, um, that may result in the Gillam County DA seat being vacated. Um, tell me, um, do you have a plan for that? I do. I do. Um, my plan, and I've already told the people in Gillam County this, I, I had started considering that maybe I needed to return closer to home. And I thought the fair thing to do was just be very upfront about my plans. So if I'm elected, I have already said I will volunteer to stay on as a special deputy district attorney and prosecute the cases for Gillam County as long as they need me. And until they can find somebody that wants to come in and really be a member of their community, because that's important to them, right now they're saying, okay, well, that'll be till next election. So I might be doing that for a while. It's what I'm already doing, but in reverse for Wasco County. I was the chief deputy district attorney in Wasco County, and we didn't have anyone apply to fill in my position. So while acting as DA of Gillum County, I, I have been acting as a special deputy district attorney for Wasco County prosecuting all of the child abuse, sex abuse, and elder abuse cases in this county. So my plan is to just switch it, flip it and switch it for as long as they need me until they can find somebody they like. And I think... Um, the governor's appointments on this topic have been really on point. So, for instance, she left open Klamath County for 13 months, despite multiple people applying for that position, until they found someone that would be a really good fit with Klamath County. So, I, and I even after they appoint someone to be DA of Gillum County, we work collaboratively in this judicial district. So, I will always be available as a resource even when there is someone else new in that position, for sure. That sounds good, yeah. And it does. it's so important for folks, especially in folks that a place like Gillam County, Sherman County, Wheeler County, to have someone appointed to that position that does know the circumstances of many of the communities. Right. What, in, yeah. in Oregon, you don't have to live in the county you represent when you're a district attorney, and there's several that don't, but... We call them the frontier counties, Wheeler, Sherman, and Gillum counties. We call them the frontier counties. That just would not fly with the citizens of any of those counties, um, or at least not. They wouldn't be happy. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, cool. So tell me, um, uh, what made you make that decision to, to make the move from Gillum County to Wasco County? Oh, wow. It was tough. I really love the people in Gillum County, but... I had a, a family tragedy and my parents really need my help and I'm just too far away to be able to help them like they need from Condon. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't in my plan for sure. Uh, I thought about actually moving back to the Dells and working remotely and just going to Condon once a week or so, but I didn't think that would be fair to my constituents because, like I said, it's very important for them to have somebody who's a member of the community. And so even though it would be lawful for me to do that, I think they would rather have me volunteer to do the extra work 
from the DAOs while they're actively looking for somebody who's able to live in the community rather than just kind of slide by on it for the next two years. So I think this is going to be a really happy compromise for everyone. Yeah, yeah. Um, How do you like Condon? I love it. I love it. I um, bought a house up there. I joined the Elks. I'm an officer. Uh, I didn't know what I was doing, what I got myself into when I first joined. Uh, but I really, I really enjoy all the work we do. Uh, I've had some listening sessions, went and spoke at the local high school. And everybody in the community has been really welcoming. Arlington is is awesome, too, though I don't spend quite as much time in Arlington as I do in Condon. But it is a great and underrated county. I kind of want people to move there, but I kind of don't at the same time because we love our our low-key lifestyle out there for sure. That's why I've heard pretty low-key. Oh, yeah. Like the golf is $10. <laughs> For a round of golf. Shh, don't tell anyone. It's an honor system, too. <laughs> it's, it's awesome. That's awesome. Ah, that's cool. So um, uh, you kind of went into this already, um, but uh, if you could kind of articulate, I think it'd be really helpful for folks. Cause I don't quite understand it. Um, when someone vacates an office, there's a process where the govern either there's another election, right, or there's a governor appoint somebody. Can you talk to that process just a little bit to help us kind of understand so we kind of get a view of what's going to happen or might not happen or whatever? Right. So if the office is declared vacant, the governor gets to appoint the next person. And then after that appointment, the next election, it's open for anybody to run the next election. So, yeah, when there's a vacancy, the governor gets to a point. The governor uh, first advertises it and lists it. We're going through a recall in Gillum County right now for some of our our um, county commissioners. So we even just verified the process with the governor's office like two weeks ago and it has to be listed so that everybody in the state who might be qualified can see the listing. They take applications, they do an interview, and then they pick who they like the best and do a background check. But it is at the sole discretion of the governor when there's a vacancy. The governor usually asks for other people in the community's opinion, but it is solely at the discretion of the governor. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks for clarifying. That's really helpful. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so um, moving on to your opponent here. Um, we only have one opponent opponent here in Wasco County. Um, um, his name's Travis. Um, and tell me about the biggest differences between you and Travis that you see. Well, um, it's funny. I think most people don't realize that in a lot of ways we are a lot alike. Um I have noticed that we even have some of the same language exactly on our different social media and our our web pages. So I think it's kind of funny. We're a lot closer than people think. But I think the biggest differences are I'm the one that has experience in Oregon. I have more experience than he does overall. I think um, he first became a member of... The New Mexico bar in 2017, that's according to uh, the records of the New Mexico Bar Association. So he is just now at seven years experience. I was first a member of the Maryland bar because I was working in Washington, D.C. before the Oregon bar. And that was in 2002. So I have 22 years experience. I have three times over three times the amount of experience just in general um, I know he has a law firm that's in New Mexico, but he's been living up here in Oregon. So I just think overall, I have a lot more experience and nearly all of my experience has been in Oregon. Um, Mr. Marston has not tried a single case in the state of Oregon yet. Oh. And I think that, I think that's a big difference. Um, I know, the judges, I know the court staff, I know the local rules, the state rules. Uh, some of the things that concern me the most are the ins and outs of Oregon's grant system, because we do rely on that for a lot of our funding, for our victims advocates. Mm -hmm. um, 
and the the role that a victim advocate plays by constitutional requirement. It is a requirement of the Oregon Constitution that victims be given certain rights. I just don't think he knows that. And I think that's the biggest difference. As far as being united on, we need to have specialty courts. Um, we need to focus on the important matters first. I think we're probably in agreement on that, or at least that's what he said in public. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It sounds like, from what you just said, and correct me if I'm wrong, it sounds like if that process isn't understood or followed fully in terms of accessing and maintaining the grants for the victims advocates, the people of Wasco County could be missing a basic constitutional right if if that isn't met. Is that, am I saying that right? If we don't have funding for victims advocates, then I don't think it would be possible for the office to be able to fulfill its obligations towards victims. They're intensive. They're, they're, there are a lot of them, and it takes a lot of work to make sure that's met. And you don't really have time to be prosecuting cases and taking care of victims' rights as well. That's what the victims' advocates are for. So that is concerning. There's also a lot of really technical requirements for many of our statutes for how you, um, for instance, how you want to do an upward departure. If, if you say, I don't, I think this case is worse than normal. I think this person needs a sentence that is worse than is normally contemplated by the sentencing guidelines. The, the hoops you have to jump through and the requirements that you have to fulfill in order to be able to seek that stiffer sentence are, are quite technical. Yeah. And you have to know how to do that. Um, I mean, I think we all just want to be safe in our community, right? And we might differ about the best ways to get there. But the nuts and bolts of it, the day in and day out of it, is we want to keep our community safe by holding people accountable for when they violate the law and do it in a manner that is fair and legal. But you can't do it at all, much less do it in a manner that's fair and legal if you don't know the laws in the first place. Yeah, exactly. And there's so many nuances in law and so many things that couple together when they didn't seem to couple together and connections and policy and things like that, that must just really come with experience you know you can read them but until they're really put into motion in the courtroom it must be hard to really uh really get some of those extra extra things right well true and and we oregon doesn't follow some model rules of law that mirror every other state if you did commercial law if you were doing like contracts for instance every single state in the u.s except for louisiana because louisiana is always the outlier <laughs> They're the weird ones. Mm -hmm. But every state except for Louisiana has adopted the Uniform Commercial Code. So you could go from state to state and be relatively confident that you got at least the big gist of it. But that is not the same for criminal law. Our, our statutes are incredibly nuanced. Some of the most litigated areas of criminal law in the state of Oregon are things like you would read the statute and if you weren't from here, you'd be like, what are you guys talking about? I don't see it anywhere in that statute. And it's like, yeah, because you got to look at a completely different statute in about 10 cases before you get there. So um, you can't you can't just read it, you know, and, and I think you might have a very firm grasp on the U.S. Constitution. I haven't had the opportunity to listen to Mr. Marston speak. I certainly think that everything we do in criminal prosecution should begin and end with the Constitution. Because the Constitution is what protects us. It's what keeps us safe. It doesn't matter what you're scared of or, or what you're, who the boogeyman is in your closet. I, I always tell people that. I don't care if you're worried about Trump and fascism or Biden and socialism. The thing that keeps whatever you're worried about from happening is our Constitution. You have to start and finish with the Constitution. Um, so I would also like to believe that I have a very firm foundation in the U.S. Constitution and the Oregon Const Constitution. And I think that is so incredibly important for informing my philosophies for how I prosecute. Cool. Thanks. Um, the other 
could, we got one more difficult question that folks had asked in the in the online sphere that we wanted to bring to you. Um, and this is to reports, unverified reports that you have a DUI on your record. Do you can you talk to that for us? Sure. Uh, I, I don't have a DUI conviction on my record, but I think it was maybe 13 years ago. I did receive a DUI for drinking too much and driving, and it was really stupid, and I shouldn't have done it. But I will tell you what, Mr. Marston has an arrest on his record, too, for, I think, unlawful use of a weapon and reckless endangering. Neither one of us have convictions. And I, I, I will say that if you were to ask me what I think makes either one of us uniquely qualified over maybe other people to be prosecutors, I think it is because we've seen it the system from this side. We've been defendants. We've both gone through the system. Neither one of us has a conviction, but we both have had to be in the middle of it. I I wouldn't wish it on anyone. Um, but, you know, if you do wrong, you get held accountable or you at least have to have your day in court to say, maybe I'm not as guilty as you think I am or do your diversion, whatever you do, whatever your course is. I think for both of us, having had to see it from that side makes us so much more well qualified to be a prosecutor than somebody that's never seen it. If you had to take two people that were exactly alike and one had been through the system and the other went it, I'm telling you every time you should take the person that's been through the system. But I can't even claim that as a benefit for me because I think Mr. Marston and I are in the same boat on that one. I wouldn't hold it against him. I, like I said, I think that makes both of us better options as prosecutors for sure. Yeah. And seeing it from that side is so, it's such an important perspective, right? Cause you, cause it is, it's completely different from a it is. point of view, right? It is. And I'm glad I, I really probably needed to learn that lesson. I really think I did. So, um, in the end, it wasn't something I ever want to repeat, but it was a net positive for me because I did take that accountability and it was embarrassing, very embarrassing, and I deserved it. So, well, cool. Thanks for, thanks for clarifying that for mm -hmm. us. That was really helpful. And I apologize for using the word record when I wasn't accurate. <laughs> That's all right. Um, do you mind me asking, what do you say to people that say you're too liberal? <laughs> I say you haven't met me. Okay. <laughs> I don't like being put in a box. Nobody gets to tell me what or who I am. Um, I, I do think I'm liberal. My boyfriend swears I'm conservative. Uh, my conservative friends swear I'm conservative. My liberal friends swear I'm liberal. I like to think I'm an independent thinker. Uh, I kind of mentioned it before with the Constitution, but when it comes to prosecuting it's not about my politi political beliefs. It's about holding people accountable in a way that is appropriate and makes us all safer. And like I said, that starts and ends with the Constitution. We have the tools in our toolbox to prosecute people appropriately. We don't need to use scare tactics and start taking away people's rights because we're worried about community safety. We just need to utilize what we've already got within our control and use them to prosecute crime in this county. I think if you look at my results and you look at the cases and look at what I've been able to do with what we have, both here and in Gillum County, my prosecution of people is fair, but it's by no means some liberal, I don't know, idea of like, abolish the police or abolish prisons. I have, I have not done that. I do utilize prisons when they're appropriate. I firmly believe in giving people second chances. I'll give anyone a chance. But you rape a baby. I'm, I'm sending you to prison. <laughs> like, I don't know. This is a long time, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, this is a very difficult math. Mm -hmm. And for people, I don't know what they think a liberal does other than I wear, I do wear flip flops a lot. I'm wearing them right now. 
I, I do. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> you, you, we'll let you off the flip flops. Yeah. You're okay. Yeah, okay. That's cool. <laughs> Providing you put that convict in jail, then we'll, you know, for any yes. of that stuff, then the flip flops will pass. I, I mean, I look at the statistics from the work I've done since I've been back as a prosecutor, and you, you look at the sentences I've been pulling down. And the number of convictions I've been getting, and they're definitely higher than the prior administrations in both my offices. Mm-hmm. So um, if by being too liberal for the office, they mean winning, I guess I guess I am. If you like a winner, vote for me. That's what I'm going to say. <laughs> Just kidding, guys. <laughs> well, no, I'm not. But, you know. <laughs> Yeah, and it's it's interesting that you I hear you say that, you know, from that liberal perspective is kind of automatically aligned with kind of, you know, established ideas like defund the police. And I and I don't I don't see that in our community. I don't see, you know, identified democrats also identifying with this notion of completely defund the police as a as a viable option. Well, for me liberalism has always been strongly rooted in the constitution again Still. because the constitution protects us from some of those inequities, right? Yeah. And it goes both ways. And I, I think that's where I stymie a lot of people, you know? Like, you, you'll you see things where there's a lot of, um, uh, for instance, during the protests, there was a lot of people saying defund the police, but at the same time, they would want, they uh, ousted that judge who was the sentencing judge in the Stanford Swimmer case. And it's like, wait a minute, you were the same people saying defund the police, abolish prisons, and now you're forcing a judge out of his job for following a pre-sentence recommendation, you know, whatever. You can think whatever you want about the sentence. My point is, is that there seems to be a lot of hypocrisy or I'll see people who are like, oh, you know, don't infringe my First Amendment freedom of speech by censoring me, Facebook. And the same people that I will see be very condescending about how Facebook isn't the government are the same people I see trying to cancel, you know, a person's career when they don't like what that person said or did in some other sphere. So I feel like people have gotten away from the traditional ideas of liberalism, which was meant to protect everybody's rights. And it's like, protect them for me, but not thee. We're seeing that a lot. And um, I think that maybe there's some unjust criticism yeah, and pointing of fingers and, and just trying to stereotype me in the same way. I think the same people that are trying to stereotype me don't like being stereotyped them selves yeah. oppositely yeah yeah and there's enough space for everyone to live in moscow county you know we can all live here you know very happily with with all these ideas and we can all coexist just fine right you can't know? we all just get along can we all just get along you know fight crime not each other yeah <laughs> you know these are the ideas you know that hopefully we're getting back to sure um you know it's as as the time you know as time goes i see that more and more you know certainly in comparison to eight years ago um so before we end i guess it'd be great just to ask about your approach to the office and like how you approach to the the da position do you want to can you talk to us about that approach sure um i probably need to give up some control i'm a little bit of a control freak, but uh, I have a very good, well-established relationship with everybody in the Wasco County District Attorney's Office right now. I touched on it earlier. There's a lot of things we know that make people fundamentally fair or fu- and more likely to um, or less likely to recidivate. So what it always comes down to is fundamental fairness. There's a theory in criminal... Um, justice work about procedural fairness, when people feel heard and when they feel like they're given a fair shake, even if you completely nail them on sentencing, they feel more respected. They feel like they were treated like a human being. They're more likely to comply with their sentence and they're less likely to commit new crimes when they are done with their sentence. So you can actually 
and I'm not advocating this, but you could actually treat people more harshly as long as, as long as you made sure that they had the opportunity to feel heard by the system and to have a say in their own outcomes. So for me, making sure that the process is fundamentally fair is one very simple thing that we can do to encourage people to comply with the system. When people believe in the system, they comply with the system. And people don't believe in a system where they feel it's opaque or it's unfair or they don't trust the people that are in charge of it, which is why I try and make myself very available to people in the community. It's why I come on shows like this, answer questions, answer the questions that the paper sends to me, answer calls and emails when I get them because that transparency and that um, accessibility helps in that feeling of fundamental fairness. So that's one approach I have. Um, I'm also really hate being a social worker. I hated it as a defense attorney and I still hate it, but it is necessary. We have a lot of underserved populations in this community, and unfortunately, the access point for many of them is through the criminal legal system. So right now, we're um, working on some options of maybe co-locating a social worker type person that can help people with wraparound services in the um, victim advocate's office of the district attorney's office. It's still super early going, so I don't want to jinx it, but... Hopefully we could get something like that. We're also working on plans. I secured some funding for Gillum County for a deflection program as part of the recriminalization of drugs. And I know Matt Ellis submitted the same funding request that I did. So we've definitely been in talks with the, and Hood River did as well. So with the other counties in this judicial district to try and have a program that, again, as people enter the system, they can be given access to all of these different services because one thing we are absolutely certain of is once you have a stable community, you have a safer community. So trying to make sure that we stabilize people on the margin that are underserviced is a huge part to trying to decrease that crime We've, we're working under some federal orders, like a Mossman order. I don't know if any of you have heard about that, but it definitely shortens the time that people can stay at the Oregon State Hospital when we're trying to get them able to aid and assist so they can be held accountable at trial. If we can't get our, our, our hands on this situation and, and get some control over the mental health situation in the community, there will be a whole group of people that are essentially unprosecutable. So we definitely need to work on access to mental health and providing stability for those communities as well. Because while they might not be out there committing the big crimes always, one, sometimes they are, and two, it, it even if they are low-level crimes, it hurts all of our quality of life to be encountering that on, on a daily basis. So we need, to, we need to get control of that situation as well, for sure. Thank you. That was a really big, full answer. That was really great. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Yeah. And um, before we close, is there anything else that we, that we need to, that we didn't touch on that you'd like to add? Uh, just that there is a candidate forum. On April 30th, I don't know who all is going to be there yet, but they've invited uh, the people who have filed to run for attorney general, secretary of state, county commissioner, district attorney. It's at the senior center, April 30th. That would be good for anybody to go to. And don't forget to vote on May 21st. Great. Well, thanks, everyone, for joining us. We really appreciate you listening and uh, to hear uh, Carrie Davis and uh, watch and her platform that she's running on for Wasco County DA. If you want to ask her questions and meet her, then you can meet her on April 30th at the Senior Center here in the Dalles uh, for Candidate Forum. And until next time, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye.